Thank you, Brother Bourne. And I want to thank all of you for being here this afternoon and for the interest that uh, you've demonstrated in, in eternal matters. It's hard to get a, a group of people uh, interested very much in the moral law of God, and uh, uh, I'm sorry to say that, but it is true. I want to begin um, by noting that I'll spend most of my time on abortion because that's the beginning point, and it's only about a half a step over to euthanasia. Abortion, induced abortion, is the ending of an innocent life without cause for money. Euthanasia is the ending of an innocent life without cause for money at the other end of life. Uh, that's what we're talking about. That most people don't want to put it in those stark terms, but nevertheless, those, those terms represent truth on the subject. I want to take you to Proverbs chapter 6 and read from uh, that chapter, verses 16 through 19. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who spreads strife among brothers. I'm going to be looking at hands, those whose hands shed innocent blood. On an average day, on an average day in the United States of America, in the home of the free, in the land of the brave, about 4,300 babies are routinely destroyed. And those who are killed in horrific manner will be killed without the benefit of legal counsel. They'll not be afforded the privilege of going uh, before a judge and having a trial. They'll be executed in grotesque and barbaric methods more cruel and inhumane than anything that Hollywood's dreamed up to put on uh, horror movies. These things are not taking place in Russia. They're not taking place in China. They're not being inflicted by the Taliban in Afghanistan. They're occurring right here in our homeland. And the co-conspirators of that atrocity includes the Supreme Court justices that were sitting prior to a, a few years ago, government social planners, political operatives, licensed physicians, and consenting mothers and sometimes fathers if they're known. The victims are not war criminals. They're not public enemies. They are innocent, pre-born human children. And this year, like Every year since 1973, your tax dollars are going to finance that, whether we like that or not. Worldwide, it's estimated that between 45 and, or 40 and 55 million abortions are performed annually. And in the, faces, in the face rather of that, that magnitude of slaughter, Pharaoh's killing of little Hebrew boys is just barely a ripple on the ocean of time. Herod's slaughter of the baby boys of the little village of Bethlehem would not equal the, the death toll inflicted by one modern clinic by, of Planned Parenthood. On January the 22nd, 1973, nine unelected lawyers wearing black robe issued a decree that will live forever in infamy. On that day, the sitting Supreme Court ruled that during the first three months of pregnancy, the decision to abort rests solely with the mother and the doctor. During the second trimester, the state could regulate abortion procedures to protect maternal health. And uh, during the third trimester, when the baby is viable, the state can regulate and even prohibit abortion except when it's necessary for the mother's mental or physical health. That's from U.S. News and World Report, 1974. The result of this deeply flawed, nonsensical, unconstitutional decision have been appalling. Through the loophole of what is said to be the mother's mental or physical health, babies are now legally destroyed throughout pregnancy, except in states 
that are imposing restrictions. You need to know that abortion is killing a living human being, a human that has brain waves, has a, an established heartbeat, whose organs are all in place by 12 weeks of gestation. You should know that Planned Parenthood harvest aborted baby parts and sells them for money. You should also know that of their, their what are called their super centers or their larger clinics, that over 80% of those clinics are located in minority communities. You should know that the only essential difference between a pre-born baby and one born is the way in which the child receives oxygen and nourishment. That's all. You should know that infanticide and euthanasia are a natural outgrowth of abortion. In 2019, the, the governor, the sitting governor of the state, or the commonwealth, really, of Virginia, Dr. Ralph Northam, a pediatric neurosurgeon, no less, advocated for what he called abortion, abortion after delivery, or euthanasia of a living person. Here's a quote from the good governor. If a mother's in labor, I can tell you exactly what would happen. The infant would be delivered. The infant would be kept comfortable. The infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and the family desired. Then a discussion would ensue between physicians and the mother. So I think this was really blown out of proportion, Northam said during a radio interview. The governor of Virginia, a pediatrician, a, neur a, a pediatric neurosurgeon advocates murdering children after delivery, and he thinks everybody's blowing it out of proportion who's upset with what he said. Northam gave a specific reason for committing this sort of murder. Severe deformities, he said, would justify that. Please note that every advocate of abortion is enjoying the right to life that was afforded to them by the protection of the law and their own parents. Humans tend to turn their face away from unpleasant scenes. I understand that. It's easy, easy to remain ignorant on issues like this. But ignorance will not excuse us, my brethren. The wise man wrote in Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12, Deliver those who are being taken away to death, those who are staggering to slaughter. Oh, hold them back. If you say we did not know this, does not he consider it who weighs the hearts? And does he not know it who keeps your soul? And will he not render to a man according to his word? The very land cries out for something to be done. Since 1973, more than 63 million innocent lives in the United States have been sacrificed. How many scientists, how many doctors, how many teachers, how many gospel preachers, how many great men and women have been lost to us because of this? At long last, a major step has been taken in the right direction. This very week, the Supreme Court annulled the effects of the Roe v. Wade deci uh, decision. There are some preliminary considerations that I want us to think about. Now, we need to understand that the battle's not over, it's just starting. But the Supreme Court wisely and correctly handed those decisions to the states where it should have been all along. Now all we will be required to do is, is fight it out in, on a state level rather than having to get into the federal judiciary and go through the various levels to finally get to the Supreme Court. It's taken 50 years of hard work and much prayer and dedication on the part of millions of people to get this before the judiciary and have them reverse this decision. It won't take 50 years. We've got a, a crowd down there in Austin. They're going to push this and they're going to come hard. And we've got to come right back. There are some preliminary considerations that we need to think about. First is 
is that which is growing in a pregnant woman's womb alive? Is it alive? Yes, it's alive. When did it come to life? When did it come to be alive? At what point in time? At the moment of conception. Now, if the life thriving in the pregnant mother, is that human life? And if it's not human life, what kind of life is it? If you read philosophy, uh, you'll get over into some things uh, called, or a thing called logic. And there is a, a law of the excluded middle. And what that, that's just a fancy way of saying it's either this or that. It can't be sort of this and sort of that. It's one or the other. And that is true here. So if it's not human life, what kind of life is it? Is it animal life? Is it vegetable life? What is it? Is this living, growing life an appendage or a part of the mother's body? Not at all. Babies regularly have even a different blood type than their mother. They are an independent being. Mother feeds them, mother provides for them. We're not taken away from what mama does. But I'm saying to you that that life is an independent life. It's a completely new life from conception. Is this life in the mother's womb innocent? And without question, it's innocent. Does abortion willfully kill this innocent human life? Yes, that's the primary reason. You go down to Houston and give them, or wherever people go now, $300 to do it. Is it wrong to willfully, knowingly kill a human life? If so, why is that? It is because, and it is wrong, and it is that is true because God bequeathed to man a status that's above every other creature he called forth on this planet. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6 says, Whosoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. Why? For in the image of God, he made him. No other creature that God made has that distinction. Vital biblical considerations come to play in wrestling with these questions. Much confusion on the issue exists because many have not really carefully thought about what Scripture says relative to abortion. A number of things, and I want us to understand this on the front end, uh, many things are determined, right or wrong, on the basis of principles revealed in the Bible. And that's, this is such a thing. And I freely grant to you this afternoon that abortion is not specifically mentioned in the Bible, either positively or negatively. Nowhere does the Bible say, thou shalt not contract for an abortion. It doesn't say that. Not in the Old Covenant, not in the New Covenant. But there are, however, many biblical principles which speak to the issue. We have, we have ample guidance from God. First of all, notice this. Life, your life, my life, every other individual's life that's granted is a gift from God himself. Acts chapter 17 and verse 25. Nor is he served by human hands since he himself gives. Now watch it. He himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. That word in English, A-L-L, -L, only three letters, but it's a big word. It's a big word. It's a big concept. And what did he say? He said, all life. God gives it. God gave the gift of life, and he alone has the right to take that life. Genesis 50 at verse 19 Joseph's brothers are before him. Their father has died, and they have what we used to call the heebie-jeebies because they know that they sold their brother into slavery. And they know that as long as their daddy was living, that he was going to be protective of them. But now, their brother, who has somehow arisen to be the grand vizier in Egypt, has them standing before him. And they're worried he's going to take vengeance. But Joseph responded to that. Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? He might have been the grand vizier of Egypt, but he recognized that he wasn't God. And so Joseph is not going to raise his hand to those brothers. He replied, it's not within my authority to kill 
any of you, for am I in the place of God? And of course, the answer is no. Only human life reflects God's image. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. That elevates human life to a place above, to a status above all other life forms on this planet. From the earliest times, the killing of, of man has been forbidden because he shares in the nature of God. Again, I'll take you back to Genesis 9 and verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. The Lord's teaching concerning the value of human life was revolutionary in his time. I, uh, people had to have been astounded. They were astounded by the words that he spoke. The world of men that Jesus encountered had little respect for human life. Historians tell us as many as 60 million souls suffered under Roman slavery, Roman bondage. Many, many thousands of the Roman citizens flocked to the Colosseum, to the games, to see men, enslaved men, have to fight one another or wild beasts in contest to the death. That was their attitude. They didn't value people very much. Infants were commonly killed at birth. If they were unwanted, they were abandoned, cast aside. Somebody could pick it up if they wanted to. In the midst of this, Jesus taught that the life of human beings is so precious that God would give his very best to save that life. John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the best that even God can do to try to save mankind. Obviously, that life is worth something to the Almighty. Subsequent to his resurrection, Jesus is still concerned about every human being. And he commissions his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And to... to to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. To teach them to observe all things. He said, whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you all the way, even to the end of this age. He's concerned. Little children were especially precious to him when he was among men. And he issued a stern rebuke to his disciples on one occasion. In Matthew 19, 13 and 14. Because they were busy with kingdom business. And they didn't want those kids up there making racket and getting in the way and causing disruption. And so they're going to run the children off. And then some children, it says, were brought to him so that he might lay hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. That is, they rebuked the children. But Jesus said, let the children alone. Do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Scripture, brethren, Scripture makes no qualitative distinction between prenatal and postnatal life, between an unborn baby and a born baby. No distinction in terms of quality. No distinction in terms of value. Not in Scripture. The same words are used in Scripture to talk of a neonate, a preborn child, that refer to a young child. Same words. Why? Because they don't make a distinction. Preborn John the Baptist is referred to as a person in Luke 1 and verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was somebody. He could leap. He could respond. Perhaps the most expressive passage in describing the personhood of a preborn child is given to us by David in Psalm 139. Verses 13 to 16. He says, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. 
Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. God recognized David as a person as he was being curiously and wondrously wrought, as he described it, in the womb. Already God had a job in mind for King David. God's law has always taught that murder's wrong. You can go back to the smoldering, trembling Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, where God is with Moses and writing on the tablets of stone, and he said, you shall do no murder. Good old King James Bible says, thou shalt not kill, but that's not what it says. What it says is, you shall do no murder. I baptized an old Marine one time that was hesitant. And I knew why he was hesitant, because he had been in combat. And I, I spoke to him, I said, let me tell you something, you didn't murder anybody. You didn't murder anybody. All you did was defend yourself in a conflict that other people put you in. Baptized him that afternoon. And so... We need to keep in mind that it's always been wrong to murder. You shall do no murder. That's what the text says. Romans 13, verse 9, you shall not murder. Both Testaments. Murder is the willful taking of an innocent life. Abortion is the planned, intentional killing of an innocent human life without cause. I mean, to say that his presence is going to be embarrassing is not a cause to kill him. To say that his presence is going to be inconvenient and it's messed up all my plans for going to the beach this summer is not a sufficient reason to kill that child. And I hope that we're all in agreement with that. The victim is completely innocent, having done no evil, spoken no ill word, not against the mother, the doctor, the society in which this procedure takes place. In many abortive situations, it is the selfish motivation of others that are placed above the life of an innocent baby. Baby can't defend himself. No baby's a grandmaster of jujitsu or taekwondo or one of the other arts, Koto, uh, uh, Shotokan or one of the other martial arts. Baby can't defend himself. He's each target. Our paramount rule of living will not allow the killing of an innocent baby with no cause. Jesus said in Matthew 7 verse 12, All things whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. For this is the law and the prophets. If this rule were applied, the abortion industry would evaporate. The clinics would close immediately for a lack of business. What mother in the world wants to be killed by a dismemberment as a DNC abortion procedure inflicts death on a children, on a child? What abortionist would want to be ripped apart? Is there a nurse anywhere on earth? who assist in abortions, who would want to be torn from her home and ripped apart literally by a powerful machine. Do you know anybody that aspires to that? Remember, by the time early abortions are performed, eight to 12 weeks, the baby has his entire organ system in place and he has the full capacity to sense pain. Paul instructs the Christian to put the good of others before his own. You know, we're hearing a lot today and seeing a, a lot of upset and disruption because people are saying, well, you know, it's my body, it's my choice, it's my life, it's my plans. Are you hearing me, 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 me? But what Paul says to us as Christians is that we are to put the good of others before ours. In Philippians 2, verses 4 through 8, the text says, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. 
have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Our Lord, brethren, condemns in the strongest possible terms those who are without natural affection. I believe I'm safe in asserting that somebody that, that has another person that they should love killed and pays money to get it done is without natural affection. Romans chapter 1 verse 31, he says, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. You don't, I don't want to stand before God having ended the life of an innocent person, young or old, without cause. Now, the objections arise. Some argue, well, now, preacher man, look here. If Adam, uh, if Adam did not receive life until God breathed in him, an unborn baby is not alive until he takes his first breath in the delivery room. Hence, he can be destroyed without incurring any guilt. Now, that's not my argument. I know that you hear that and you think, well, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. It's not my argument, but that's an argument to make. You see, because Adam had no life at all prior to the time that God breathed into him. Adam had no life. Infants are alive from the moment of conception. They are developing from the very moment that God breathes on them. Oxygen is supplied in that baby's umbilical system. He's alive and growing. When he's born, he simply switches breathing and feeding systems. I've seen it happen. I was with my wife when my children were born. And I saw the the switch over from the umbilical system to the child went independent. I remember the doctor patting one of ours uh, on the chest saying, breathe baby for your mama and that kid uh, lit up. Because the first time you take that breath, that's, a, that's uncomfortable, they tell me. I don't know. I don't remember. I was there when I was born, but I don't remember. But you see, it's, it's not a parallel at all. Human life it is now a demonstrated scientific fact. They've caught up. Is It begins at conception. James tells us the body, apart from the spirit, is dead. James 2 and verse 26. Just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead being alone. And so, the spirit has to be present for the body to develop. The converse, you see, if the spirit body without the spirit is dead, then the converse has got to be true. To be alive, the spirit must be in the body. The baby in utero is alive. If the baby weren't alive, nobody would be getting an abortion. There wouldn't be any compelling reason to do that. But this baby has a spirit. Some feel, well, Exodus 21, 22 shows the mother is worth more than the baby. There it says, if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life. So the argument is, if the baby's killed, only a fine is imposed. If the mother's killed, capital punishment's imposed. Therefore, the unborn baby is not a person. Well, that which proves too much proves nothing. And this proves far too much. You'll notice if you go further down and read verses 28 through 37, you find if your ox kills a slave, there's only a, pose, a, a fine imposed. If it kills a free man, it's life for life. Now, is that, is that to say that a slave is not a person to be killed on a whim? 
If you're going to argue like they do, I don't know why you wouldn't. See, there's an alternative to that reasoning. The words, yet there is no injury, means that the child is prematurely born, but he doesn't die. He can go on his own. He's early, but he's going to make it. Then the expression, if there's any further injury, the New American Standard has it, means that if either the child or the mother, or both of them die, the guilty man's executed life for life. The fine is for injury, causing early delivery. The death penalty is for causing death. Regardless of the construction that we put on the passage, it does not parallel abortion. See, Moses is dealing with accidental injury. Abortion is intentional, willful destruction of innocent life. Those two are not parallel. Well, then the question arises, and it's a good question, well, what is permitted when the mother's life is under genuine threat? In other words, you've got a situation here, you're going to have one death or two deaths. Doesn't happen much, but it happens sometimes. It's rare, but it can happen. Okay, so what do you do? I'll illustrate what one doctor, Dr. Uh, Jerome Lejeune, answered this way. He said, I would never attack and kill an unborn child. He then explained, if faced with a truly life and death situation, that he would remove a cancerous uterus or a tubal pregnancy. In doing so, the child would inadvertently die. But this wouldn't have been the purpose of the surgery. While you may feel, well, that's simply an exercise in semantics, it is a fine distinction. Because it surely reflects a difference in motivation and a sacred respect for all human life. Fortunately, the circumstances where a mother's life is jeopardized in pregnancy is rare today. I shall never forget what our, pediatri no, our gynecologist and OB-GYN uh, OB doc told our, my wife when uh, we were pregnant. He, uh, she asked him about, can I do this, can I do that? And he, he said, well, if you're used to doing it, being vigorous and active, that's fine. And then he said, let me just stress to you, you're just pregnant, hon, you're not sick. A, a pregnant woman is not a sick woman. And it's treated like a disease. It's not a disease. It's, a, it's something to celebrate. Dr. J.F. Hefferman says, anyone who performs a therapeutic abortion, that is for disease or something like that, is either ignorant of modern methods of treatment or unwilling to take the time to use it. Well, here's the hard one, the hardest one to my mind. What about abortion in the case of a rape? That's uh, the most horrific and barbaric injustice that could be imposed on anybody. And we have to face that with uh, as much compassion as is possible on our part. It is brutal beyond all reason. One thing that must happen, that needs to happen, is that immediate medical intervention needs to take place because you can often, almost always, prevent conception from taking place, and thus there is no unwanted pregnancy. But the question has got to be asked, you know, what if there is? The question has got to be asked, is life, all of life, sacred? Is it sacred or is it not? And if it's sacred, then it's got to be protected. There's punishment it should be meted out here, but it ought to be directed at the father, not the innocent baby. The baby's innocent. Well, what if somebody in your family, I haven't faced that yet, but the baby's still innocent. Life is God's gift. Acts 17, 25, he gives to all life and breath and all things. Would danger of deformity make an abortion an acceptable alternative? Well, I'd pose the same question. Is all human life sacred or is it not? Is a defective child in the womb human life? Is he human life after he's born or she's born? 
If we decide to eliminate defective unborn children, why not execute them that are born? Just how perfect do you have to be to live? I had the opportunity to take a social work degree at Fried Hardeman University. And there was a girl in our program, and I can't remember her last name, Jan was her name. She was a thalidomide baby. She was born with no arms, none whatsoever. And I can remember going into the, to the cafeteria to, to eat one afternoon, and I noticed this girl over there talking, and she was doing her hair. You know how girls flip their hair and all of that? eating her food, and I noticed something odd, and then it dawned on me, she doesn't have any arms, she's eating with her feet. All I had to do for her is cut up the meat and put her drink in a cup, and Jan could take care of the rest of it. She ended up working in a, in a rehab center, and she was the intake social worker, so they come in and see somebody with no arms, people that have had all kinds of injuries. Now, should Jan's parents have had her aborted? Or did, did she have a right to live? And I could go on and on and on. Because we've worked with special people. My wife worked with special people all her life. And uh, their life's precious too. You know a lot about a society by how they take care of their young, their old, and their infirm. Should Christians fight in this battle? Traditionally, brethren, we have stood back and hesitated to actively oppose this evil because we've been busy fighting about, I don't know, orphans' homes, communion cups, fellowship halls, and let me, I, I could go on. I'll just stop right there. If we can oppose tobacco, alcohol, gambling, and dancing, does anybody oppose that anymore? Am I the only preacher left in the world that preaches on that? A lot of brethren won't touch it. I mean, you couldn't shine them in, a, put them in a light and shine them on the subject. But if we can oppose those things, can't we come out against killing innocent babies? God's people are duty bound to give aid to those who are under threat. Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12, the wise man writes, Deliver those who are being taken away to death. And those who are staggering to slaughter. Hold them back. If you say, see, we didn't know this. Does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? Does he not know it who keeps your soul? And will he not render to man according to his work? Yes, he will. We cannot hide behind the feeble question of Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? Because Jesus said, you are. We all agree that children of God should not partake of the deeds of darkness. Paul writes in Ephesians 5 and verse 7, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful darkness, but rather reprove them. Not only stay away from it, oppose it. When Herod slaughtered uh, maybe 15 or 20 babies in Bethlehem, the evangelist said Rachel wept for the children and could not be comforted. In Matthew 2 and verse 18, More than a million babies are killed in this country annually. Do you hear way, Eve wailing? And grieving her babies. Our highest court. Assured us for 50 years. That bloody murder was legal. And right. Experts told us it was necessary. For good high quality life. We were assured that society. Is better uh, off. Without those that are unloved. And unwanted. Abortionists tell us it's more humane. To abort handicapped babies. The peerless Isaiah said in Isaiah 5, 20 and 21, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. What must we do? We must educate ourselves and we must educate our society to the reality of this monstrosity. And there is little public knowledge on the cruelty of abortion procedures. Few are well prepared to give adequate biblical refutation on abortion propaganda, but we must prepare ourselves. And we must work toward a constitutional amendment guaranteeing the right of life to all human beings, saving cases where the mother would be doomed to death if she tried to deliver. 
We must educate our young people concerning human sexuality in a Christian context. A high percentage of abortions are performed on unwed mothers. Parents and churches must provide biblical instruction in morality. And harsh judgmentalism must be replaced. It must be discarded with Christian compassion put in its place when an unwanted pregnancy occurs. We had a family at Livingston some years ago. A girl was pregnant out of wedlock. She responded to the invitation. And so did her mother and daddy. They came with her. They supported her. They've been with her. That child was born into this world as a school teacher today and a faithful Christian. Her mother is married and has a family. And I've admired them so much for the way they handled that situation. It was very difficult for them. Harsh judgmentalism would drive someone to the friendly abortionist, and Uncle Sam is glad to spend your Medicaid money killing those children. May all God's children arise in holy indignation, and may we drive this satanic evil once and for all from our land. Take up the sword of the Spirit and dare to dream the impossible dream that somehow, some way, someday, it will be rid of it forever. I didn't get to euthanasia and my time's up. But I'll just say this about euthanasia. God promised his people one time if they didn't walk in the, in the path that a nation of fierce countenance who would have no respect for the old nor show favor to the young would arise against them. We're in that place. We're in the Deuteronomy 28, 50 place. And you can be assured that someday, if this thing continues, that the young people whose brothers and sisters we killed will kill us for our estates, for our money. They'll pay that doctor. You can believe if a doctor will accept money to kill an innocent baby, that he'll accept money to kill a feeble old person. Rise up and oppose these things. May God bless you this day. I was going to say the same thing. Amen to that. What a what a beginning to our lectureship on God's uh, moral law. And uh, appreciate Brother Mitchell and doing a fine job and sharing some of that information with us. And and uh, I was, you know, pondering. Um, uh, as he was talking about uh, God recognizing life in the wound. You know, we see that in Psalm 139. But not only does he recognize life in the wound, he... He has a purpose for that life in the womb, as we see in Jeremiah 1 and verse 5. And just a remarkable job this morning, this, this afternoon. I appreciate our brother. We look forward to our next uh, lecture. At, uh, actually, it's in a few minutes.